All right, in today's lecture, we're going to talk about um, kind of the fundamentals of chemistry, which are matter and energy. And um, we're going to start, really, I got these a little out of order. We're going to just start by defining energy because energy is important to understand um, matter and then how matter interacts. So um, this is the um, lecture 0101. So energy, to define it, it's like a ghost. So if I was just doing kind of a hand-waving explanation of what energy is, it's, a, it's like a ghost. You know it's there only when it's able to move and change matter. For example, this ball could be moved to a different height, and it would suddenly have energy in it, stored in the form of gravitational potential energy. But you wouldn't know it's there unless you did something with it like you released it and you saw it start bouncing or you heard it bouncing on the table. And the batteries in this flashlight over here, they actually have energy in the form of chemical store potential energy. And this is why I say it's kind of like a ghost. It's there, but I don't know it's there until it starts to move and change matter. So when we flip the switch electrons transfer, and I kind of showed the actual chemicals that are transferring between, but uh, electrons leave zinc, move over to manganese. And when those electrons move, we harvest those electrons, turn it into light. And then all of a sudden you go, oh, there's a change in the matter. And you're starting to see light come off. And that's a form of energy. Now, when you talk about measuring energy, you measure it in either calories. That's the common thing we talk about. If you uh, pick up a candy bar or something, you look at the calories. That's how much energy. So once again, that's chemical potential energy in the form of food that when you put into you, it's able to turn into like right now, turning the sound of my voice or uh, into motion. Um, in, in the more scientific, um, instead of using the imperial measurements, you're using more of the uh, metric system. You might measure it in scientific measure of joules. Now, I said kilojoules here. But we'll talk about that a little later in the, in the um, semester about what a kilo is. It just adjusts the size of the joule. So I might talk about a millijoule making that a certain size of joule or a kilojoule that's a certain size of joule. But we'll talk about that a little later. But I'm just saying that there are 100 calories in a banana. There are also 418 kilojoules in a banana. All right, so that's energy. And it's important for understanding basically matter. So matter is stuff, right? So when we say, oh, I see anything around me, I see the desk, I see the table, I see whatever, that's stuff. And the stuff is made up of fundamental building blocks of all that stuff are atoms. So when you have that periodic table in your hand, you're actually looking at all of the atoms that make up everything, all the stuff around us that we see. And so, <clears throat> Fundamentally, the fundamental building blocks are called atoms or elements, and those are fairly interchangeable. Now, atoms can start to mix, and when they mix, they'll either mix loosely and not associate with less energy. In other words, I could take some copper, um, you know, little copper filings, or I could take some copper jewelry and I could mix it. So I've got some gold here and I could mix gold with whatever I got here. This is kind of a stainless steel ring I have. So I can mix them. Those, those elements are just hanging out together. They're in a mixture and that doesn't take much energy to separate them back. The other way things can mix is they can mix and intimately bond. And that's what we'll learn a lot in this class is the formation of chemical bonds. So that's a little bit different. Now, if they mix and they come back apart, like we put iron and zinc together, and then they're still there. You look in there and you see the mixture. You can see the individual parts. Those are called heterogeneous. And when they come back apart, right, just that easy, then you go, oh, that was just a mixture. Now, on the other hand, I might take like iron and iodide and I mix them together and they actually make a chemical bond and it changes colors and there's energy given off and I go, oh my gosh, that's something different. And I make this new iron iodide. So this is iron three iodide and it's 
completely chemically different than the iron or the iodide was before. And it doesn't break back apart. And there was a lot of energy involved in that mixing relationship. Chemical bonds were broken and formed. So this is called a compound now. So when we talk about compounds, we actually use this notation um, where we use the subscripts. So here I had iron and zinc mixed. If I had mixed two zincs, I would just say, okay, I put a two in front. That would be two zincs and one iron. But here, when I'm trying to say that they're chemically connected, I put this little subscript down here. And we'll talk about that more in class as well. But this is a compound. So I'll just give you this heads up first off that when you see chemical elements um, and you start to see these subscripts, you can, you can guess that there's chemical bonding in there that has hooked those together. These are connected chemically. If you see a coefficient in front, a number out in front that's not subscripted at all, then that's actually referring to the number of whatever's following it. So these these subscripts like this, they tend to relate to the atoms that are before it. And then when you see numbers in front as coefficients, they refer to the um, elements that are afterwards. And one other thing I would point out about elements before we move on too far is that you'll notice at most they have two letters. The first letter is capital. The second letter is lowercase. So in case of cobalt, for example, there's a C capital and an O lowercase. But if I wanted to say I was connecting a carbon to an oxygen, they would both be uppercase. All of this is great. We'll re more time to revisit as we go, but this is your first introduction. So for, for right now, your focus should be defining, you know, what a mixture is versus a compound. And you're basically talking about physical change versus chemical change. And when you make this mixture right here, it's very little energy to break it back apart. I mean, if there is any attraction whatsoever, it takes nothing, next to nothing in terms of energy to, to separate. This, though, has made a very strong bond. And look, relative order of magnitude, it would take thousands of kilojoules of energy to re-separate it. Okay. Now, you have some other ways that uh, compounds can act. So, for example, I have this compound sodium chloride, and it can interact with water. Basically, I'm putting salt water together, correct? And then all of a sudden, you see that, that solution turn clear. That gets a special name. That's called a solution. When you actually take salts, you put them into uh, water, and then they dissolve. But then you can get them right back out. Then that's called a solution. And it's very unique. It's called homogeneous. So that's a homogeneous mixture, per se, because they say that the sodium chloride isn't really lost in there. It didn't change properties. On the other hand, if I took lead nitrate and potassium iodide and I put them together, I might get a chemical change and I might make lead iodide a, a unique um, individual atom that come out of there that I can't re-separate the lead nitrate. I can't get the potassium iodide back. It's now a new compound. So that was a chemical combination. And new properties will be shown. And again, in terms of uh, energy, when you're doing kind of chemical change or physical change where you're just you know, combining things, and then you can uncombine them. That's, you know, on this, in this particular reaction, it's a little bit more energetic um, because the sodium chloride does disassociate, and that's a whole nother story. But it's still orders of magnitude less than the energy involved in the bond breaking bond forming. So here are some different links. If you want to uh, download these slides and click on those, you'll see other examples. So you're getting used to this physical change versus chemical change. Now, another way to think about physical change, it's a little simpler, as you can just say, there's something called a change of state. So if you think about the states of matter, no matter what exact atoms I'm talking about or, or compounds that I have, and if I'm just going to run them through physical change, they would just change state. So they could be in the solid state, 
the liquid state or the gaseous state. So what we think about the solid state is it's locked together in a crystal lattice. It's made into a crystalline form and it's just vibrating. And the thing that makes it vibrate is temperature. So if you'll look on this chart, I'm going to basically apply a little bit more energy. So let's just pretend this is water. So at this point, it's solid. So it's, it's, it's technically ice. And I have ice well below zero degrees. And I'm going to start raising the temperature so that ice is going to just start vibrating more and more. But it's still in the solid state. And that's solid ice. And then you get to a change of state where it actually starts melting. And as you pour more energy in, the temperature doesn't change. So it's interesting. When ice melts at zero, it turns to water at zero. But now the water molecules are no longer locked together in a crystal like this. They actually start rotating next to each other. And that's what water is about. Which, by the way, that is a, uh, a molecule interaction. The rotation is something that the microwave just locks onto. That's why you can send microwaves through solid glass, hit the liquid water inside, and the water is the one that predominantly heats up as opposed to the solid. But here we go. Now we're using some chemical symbols. We're saying, oh, we've got water. Now, again, remember we said if you're using this subscript, that means that the hydrogens, there's two hydrogens attached to an oxygen, and this is one compound. But now we're going to talk about physical state. So we use this parentheses to say, oh, it's solid versus liquid. So we went from the water ice state to the water liquid state. And that's called melting. Most of you know that, but we're going to learn these terms for changing state. Now we start to heat up the water. It's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Okay, getting ready to put some tea in there, for example. It's now spinning faster and faster and faster. That's what happens when you add more temperature. And at some point, at sea level, around 100 degrees, it would actually start those, those small interactions that hold it together would pop free, and it would actually start, the water molecules would start moving freely around. And that's what we call boiling, right? Liquid water turns into steam. And then the molecules are freely moving around. And we call that boiling or vaporizing. And that's kind of, yep, random motion of the particles. So now we're going to just finish out some of these terms. But this is, this is physical change. The water that started out as ice is the same water that's in the uh, steam. It's still water, it's still H2O, it still has many of the same properties. The properties haven't changed. All right, so now let's get some of our definitions down. If I took the, the now this is just basically saying, yeah, if you heat up steam, you can make steam hotter too. It'll just travel faster. Okay, now if you go the other way, if you take steam and you turn it back to liquid, we call that condensation or condensing. And again, this will come up a few times because you hear weathermen refer to this as precipitation. But generally, we kind of reserve the term precipitation for another chemical event, which I'll talk about later. So we call going from the gaseous state to the liquid state condensing. <clears throat> and then when you go from the liquid state and go back to ice, we call it freezing. And we're aware of that. Now, the harder one that some people don't know is if you took solid, like you took dry ice, and you went directly to the gaseous state, that's called sublimation. And if you took a gas, like clouds, and you turn them directly into the solid state, like snow, that's called deposition. So these are six terms I want you to be familiar with that I might ask questions about what, you know, what is the name of turning something from the gaseous state all the way back to the solid state? That's deposition. Perfect. All right. So kind of discriminating between physical and chemical change. Just a couple other thoughts. Physical change is usually fairly simple to track because it's a change of state and the properties are not affected, okay? Even if I take aluminum solid and I melted it, 
it would still be aluminum. It would be molten, but once it cooled, it would come back to solid and be the same aluminum as they started with. Chemical change, on the other hand, will result in the change in the properties of the substance. So I can take two properties like sodium, which is a metal that when it hits water, it starts skirt, skirting around and, and reacts violently. In fact, if I put it on my tongue, it'd burn a hole in my tongue, right? Or chlorine gas, which if I took it in real high concentrations would poison me. And yet if I combine sodium and chloride with chemical bonds, it would make salt, table salt, which I put on my green beans. So certainly the properties have changed. Now, physical changes are easiest to track because we're familiar with change of state. Chemical changes are a little harder to see because I can't see whether the atoms are making or breaking chemical bonds. So I'm going to give you kind of a mnemonic to, to watch out for if a chemical change is taking place. So CPTG. So you can memorize that however you best can. I always say Cole Perkins tall guy because I used to teach a kid in high school chemistry that was much bigger than me and every once in a while I get excited and shake me and I would be like Cole you're gonna break me you gotta stop so I always remember Cole Perkins tall guy but C is for color anytime you see a color change it's probably chemical change P is for precipitation now that's the unique one where two clear liquids come together and they form a solid out of there and I'll show you this. I'll give you a video where I demonstrate this. So this little demonstration, I'm going to show you what a, a chemical precipitate is as opposed to a physical precipitate. Sometimes we talk about uh, precipitation uh, as like rain falling, but technically when we have gas turning to liquid, we usually call that condensation. But anyway, when you hear the word precipitation in chemistry, what you're talking about is a unique phenomenon, and I'm going to demonstrate it for you here. I have two relatively clear liquids in here. The one on your right is a zinc sulfate, so I'm going to draw kind of a picture, and I'll show you what that is. Um, So the, the chemicals on the right are zinc sulfate. So there's a zinc ions in there. And we'll talk about that later in this semester, what an ion is. But it's charged metal, so it's able to float in the water. And then the sulfate ions are negatively charged. They're floating around in the water. But basically, it makes the water clearer. And you can see just a little bit, the slightest amount of cloudiness. Okay, so that's a fairly clear liquid. And on this side, I've got common baking soda in this little glass I have here. That's sodium carbonate. So it's the same sort of situation where you have the metal sodium. It's positively charged. It's surrounded by water and lifted up and carbonate, which is negatively charged, surrounded and picked up by water. So it's, you can tell it's, it's still a little under mixed. I made it hot so as it cooled, it's kind of fallen out of solution a little bit. But now we're at room temperature. They're both at the same temperature. You in essence have a slight two slightly cloudy solutions. But even if they were crystal clear, um, what you are looking for in a chemical precipitate is when you you see a simultaneous change in state from liquid to solid. And what it appears in the fluid is if it's cloudy. So we're going to just Zoom in on this one, and I'll just pour the other one in there, and you'll see it immediately start to precipitate. Now, once again, there's no temperature change. This is the two chemicals interacting. There you go. There you go. And it immediately clouds up with that dark white powder. Okay, and that dark powder is a unique species. It's called zinc carbonate and it's all one compound and this all locks together so the zinc comes over and finds the carbonate and they lock and they lock so tightly because of the positive two and minus two charge that water can't surround them and break them apart so it makes an insoluble powder and so you can see and it's even starting right now the powder is starting to settle out and fall to the bottom so that is a precipitate.
So when you hear about a precipitate, what you're seeing is two clear liquids come together and a, and a solid is formed. Now there may or may not be a color change. This one in essence isn't a color change because if you think about the original powders that make clear liquids, they're usually white. But they did change state because they were both dissolved, right? They were both solutions and then all of a sudden it turned to solid. So I hope that helps. Temperature change, there's no outside heat source involved, but all of a sudden you start to feel temperature change. Like when somebody snaps a cold pack and all of a sudden it turns cold and there was no outside refrigerator, no reason the temperature should change, that's chemical change, right? Sometimes you run reactions, you put them together and all of a sudden the beaker gets hot all by itself. That's evidence of chemical change. The last one is gas given off. So anytime I mix two, uh, you know, a solid, I drop it in a liquid and I start seeing bubbles start showing up, I go, oh, that's chemical change. So those are uh, four things you should watch for. They can have false indicators. For example, if you're in art, you might know, oh gosh, if I take some colors like yellow and blue, I might get green. I don't know if that's the right mixture, but something like that. That's an optical effect. But if I take two clear liquids and yellow pops out of there, I'm like, oh, that's definitely chemical change. Um, temperature, you usually are aware of whether there's an outside temperature source. So that's not so easy to get tricked by. Gas, though, can be uh, tricky because, for example, when I open a soda pop, I'm not enacting chemical change. I had already forced the gas in. And when I pop the top, it released the gas. So that wasn't a chemical change. But on the other hand, if I poured a soda pop onto something and then new gas, like, like I had a dead soda and I poured it onto something, and all of a sudden gas started bubbling again, I'd go, oh, well, that's chemical change. All right. So here's a, a chance for you to practice some things. This will help you think about this. Um, what I'd like you to do is ident identify the following as chemical change or physical. If it's chemical change, give the evidence out of that CPTG. And if it's physical change, name the state change. So that'll be good practice for you. So I'm going to have you, why don't you just pause your video, try and answer these, and then here in a minute we'll start back up, and then uh, you can see what the answers are. See how you did. So gasoline burning in your car. So what do you think? So that's considered a chemical change. And what would be my evidence? So is there a color change? Mm, not necessarily. You might not think that there's a color change, but you might see a yellow or blue flame where before you didn't. So that would be evidence. Um, is there a precipitate? No. Is there a temperature change? Certainly there's a temperature change. In other words, once you ignite it, there might be a little spark come near, but the whole entire gasoline can start burning and you generate all sorts of additional heat. So that's chemical change. And then there's a gas given off. So when gasoline is uh, burning, you'll see uh, water and carbon dioxide leaving the reaction. So I put in like the liquid gasoline and I come out with gaseous carbon dioxide and water. Um, the second one, ice melting in your driveway. That one I would consider to be physical change. For one thing, the um, water, ice, is still there present after the melting, and that's called um, melting. So that is the, that is the actual uh, state change. Formation of snow from clouds, that again is a physical change. And that is your deposition reaction, where you go from gaseous all the way to solid in one step. Eggs cooking on a skillet, you might say temperature change, but that's an outside temperature source. That's not the eggs themselves. You don't just pop open eggs and all of a sudden they start getting hot. So that doesn't really count. I do see color change though. So I certainly go in with clear eggs and they turn white and that's evidence that there's chemical change. And then using my lighter is the same thing as kind of gasoline burning. I have a liquid uh, butane in there. It hits oxygen with a little bit of ignition source. I get all sorts of heat off of that. And also you can see gases come off of that. So 
See how you did. So hopefully this helps you understand kind of the introduction to uh, chemistry. I want you to be able to differentiate solid, the vibrational state. Liquid is where you're rotating. Gas is where it's freely moving. Know the names for phase changes. Uh, melting, freezing, right? Boiling, condensing. And also going the other way from sublimation and uh, deposition. Know that the difference between an element or an atom versus a compound or molecule. So atoms and elements, when they connect chemically, then they become compounds. And the other word for compound is molecule. Know the difference between physical and chemical change. Physical is change of state, much less energy involved. Chemical change is uh, where there's bonds formed or broke, and it's a high amount of energy involved. And again, just understanding what energy is, it's the ghost that uh, moves or changes matters. And then uh, the last one is probably out of these definitions, remember that homogeneous mixtures are what we call solutions, salt and water, Epsom salt and water, sodium carbonate and water, that sort of idea where they you put a solid into the water and it disappears, or even like Gatorade when I put it in water and I get this uh, consistent orange solution. That's called a homogeneous mixture. If I look at sand or if I took uh, two, you know, a white powder and a yellow powder and I mixed them and you just have this mixture of white and yellow, that none of that would, that those are called heterogeneous mixtures. All right, I hope that helps.